Hi everybody. Hopefully um, you can all hear me clearly. Um, thanks for joining us today um, for the next in the scientific webinar series that we're running. Uh, today um, our guest speaker is um, Peter Kilford. Um, just to mention before we kick off, um, uh, you'll find that you are muted. Um, and that's just to um, let the um, presentation run through. Um, please do use the chat um, function to um, raise any questions that you have. And uh, we'll take questions um, at the end uh, of the presentation. Um, and just for your information as well, we'll be uh, recording this presentation and um, afterwards, like the other presentations, it will be available on YouTube. If you just do the next slide, Pete. So uh, today, as I mentioned, we've got Peter Kilford. Um, he um, is principal scientist in the translational science team um, in, in Sitara Simsip division. Um, he is a graduate from um, CAPCA. Um, and primarily his work was looking at in vitro assessment on uh, glucuronidation clearance. Um, so he's well versed in IV, IVE. Um, and that was in the uh, University of Manchester, obviously, with CAPCA. So he joined us in uh, 2019 and um, currently heads up um, the, um, the compound um, projects. Um, most recently version 20, but obviously going on into version 21 as well. So uh, today's talk is um, looking at um, itraconazole, and that's obviously quite a hot topic for a lot of people um, in terms of looking at the PBBK models which are available. Um, he's going to be comparing some of those and um, talking about some of the difficulties as well of, of um, Intraconsole as PPK file and showing how well you can do. So Pete, um, thanks for agreeing to um, speak today and uh, looking forward to your talk. Thanks for the introduction, Ollie. Um, so um, as Ollie said, I'm going to be talking about Intraconsole today. Um, I'm going to be focusing on a comparison of the PPK models that are available and uh, it's a focus on, on those that we have in the simulator and also some of the more recently published uh, PPK models in itraconazole. I'm not going to be focusing on any prospective use of, of itraconazole to look at uh, appropriate dosing dosage regimens for, for clinical DDI studies. I think there's been a, a really great job of that done in the publications that are, are already out there. What I'm more going to be focusing on this uh, presentation is, is sort of an introduction to itraconazole and a comparison of the models that are out there, and also a little lo a look at the uh, performance of those models across the PK exposure and also the DDI studies, with some recommendations towards the end of, of how they perform and, and scenarios where, where some models might perform better than, than others. So itraconazole itself was, uh, has been uh, used for a long time now. It was approved in the US in, in 1992. Clinically, it's used to treat a number of different fungal infections. There's, there's a whole range of those that is now approved for when you look at its label recommendations. And it has a broader uh, spectrum of activity than, than other drugs like fluconazole that are a narrower spectrum than, than some of the other antifungals that are on the market. In terms of um, its ph pharmacological action, its uh, mechanism of action is, is uh, inhibition of the fungal-mediated synthesis of uh, ergosterol via inhibition of the lanosterol 14-alpha demethylase pathway. Um, the structure of itraconazole is just shown at the uh, bottom of this slide here. It has uh, three chiral carbons within its structure. And because of this, the, the clinical formulation is a, a mixture of uh, four stereoisomers. Itraconazoles are available in a, a couple of different dosage forms. You can, it's available as uh, Sporinox, by, uh, which is uh, uh, supplied by Janssen Pharmaceutica. And this is available as uh, 100 mg uh, capsule doses. 
it has a very complex formulation as itraconazole has a, a very low solubility uh, and the solubility is also uh, pH sensitive and the formulations also contain uh, cyclodextrin which uh, complicates some of the absorption processes. And because of this often the capsules are recommended to be taken uh, with food. There's also another formulation available and that's a, an oral solution formulation and um, again due to the absorption and uh, limits of the solubility it's advised to be either taken one hour before or, or two hours after food. In terms of dosing regimens uh, there's quite a lot of, of differences although generally if you look at the label recommendations it's commonly given as a 200 mg once daily dose of, of itraconazole. Although for some indications this can increase up to a 200 mg uh, twice daily dose of itraconazole. There's a whole range of DDI studies published in the literature now using itraconazole and, and if you look at these there's quite a mixture of uh, dosing uh, regimens used in those uh, published studies and that ranges for anything from single dose of, of the solution or, or capsule dose in either fed or fasted state up to uh, once daily and even BID dosing and there's even some mixed dosage patterns used of uh, BID initially moving on to, to QD later on in the dosing. So we need to, when, we, when we're looking at itraconazole in terms of PVK modeling, we need to be able to capture all of these different scenarios. As you can imagine, um, cip, uh, itraconazole is uh, mainly metabolized by, by CYP3A4 and because of this there's, there's a number of uh, label warnings that come with, with itraconazole. The first of those label warnings comes uh, along uh, the use with PPIs and they, um, you can imagine this is from the absorption side of things, the PPIs may uh, impair the absorption of itraconazole. And there's suggestions in there to stagger the, the doses to try and minimize the interactions if, if a subject is on uh, proton pump inhibitors. Because of its uh, high metabolism by CYP3A4, the co-administration of itraconazole with CYP3A4 inducers is not recommended in the label, so it should, uh, use of CYP3A4 inhib uh, inducers should be avoided from two weeks before and also during treatment with itraconazole. In terms of co-administration of itraconazole with CYP3A4 inhibitors, it, it sort of leaves this as it should be used with uh, caution in the, in the label. And that if you do uh, administer with CYP3A4 inhibitors, then uh, the patient should be monitored for signs of prolonged pharmacologic uh, effects of itraconazole. Because of its um, complex metabolism and interaction, uh, you, there also needs to be caution of administering itraconazole with, with other drugs, co-administered drugs, as it may affect the metabolism of the other drugs it's administered with. And there's a whole table, a uh, very long table in the uh, label warnings of other drugs where we need to have caution when we're, we're dosing them with itraconazole. And they've been split into drugs that are contraindicated to drugs that are, are not recommended to be dosed with itraconazole and, and the list of drugs that can be used but with caution. So in terms of the metabolism of uh, itraconazole, in terms of its uh, extended clearance classification uh, system, it's classified as a, a class two compound, which is, is metabolism dependent. And it undergoes 90% metabolism uh, from the published studies. It has nonlinear PK and, and complex DDI mechanisms, and it's thought that the nonlinear PK is, is driven by um, inhibition of CYP3A4 which is inhibiting for by its uh, metabolites which is in inhibiting the metabolism of the parent compound itself. There are three major metabolites of itraconazole. You have hydroxy itraconazole, keto itraconazole and the end as uh, alkyl itraconazole. A number of reports suggest that they are formed uh, sequentially from itraconazole although given the structures it, it's possible that they may not be formed solely by sequential metabolism and that they may be formed uh, it, from, from itraconazole itself or from the hydroxy. It's thought that all three metabolites are able to in, inhibit the uh, CYP3A4, but there's quite a range of in vitro data available uh, in the literature for both the metabolism and the interaction parameters of itraconazole and all of its metabolites. So it's quite challenging to be able to interpret this and, and to be able to determine what's going on in terms of this complex metabolism. 
And I'll talk more on this as we move through the, the PVK models, as, as more in vitro data has become available through a lot of the extra work that's been done over the last few years. In terms of um, itraconazole and, and the work that's done in um, SimSip, so it really stems, uh, the use of itraconazole has really vastly increased um, since it was recommended in 2013 that the uh, go-to CYP3 for inhibitor ketoconazole for DDI studies should not be used due to some of the um, adverse effects, uh, uh, events that were seen with, with using ketoconazole. So itraconazole has been used more and more as a, a CYP3A4 inhibitor in, in DDI studies, and that's really brought about a, an increase in the amount of understanding we're getting on the in vitro parameters for, for itraconazole and the interaction parameters which feed into the PVK models. In terms of SimSIP, we, we first added itraconazole back in, in version 4, in fact, of, of the simulator. And it's been refined over the years as more in vitro data has become available. And we've also added in the, the hydroxy metabolite as well with its uh, CYP3 4 inhibition parameters as well. And the main purpose of the itraconazole file when it was added was to be able to capture multiple dose exposures of, of itraconazole. In version 19, we've also added the option to select ADAM instead of a first order absorption model for itraconazole. And you can uh, activate this by going to any of the first, either of the first or model, order models, moving to the absorption tab and, and selecting the ADAM model for itraconazole. And this will populate all of the uh, required ADAM parameters for, for itraconazole. And this can be used in both the capsule and the uh, solution files that are in the simulator. And the ADAM model can be used in, in fed or fasted state by, by changing the uh, the uh, food state in the uh, trial design tab. And the ADAM model was really designed to be able to try and account for the uh, complex formulation for itraconazole, uh, for things like uh, cyclodextrin and, and others that are in the, the formulation, and to try and account for that absorption phase. Because the other models that we're, I'm going to talk about today are, are not ADAM models, they're first order files, I'm, I'm not going to show too much on the ADAM model. We've, we've talked about this in the release version for uh, notes for version 19, if anyone's particularly interested, although I do have one slide on it at the end of this presentation. So in terms of the SimSip itraconazole file, um, this applies, I say first order, actually a lot of this applies to the first order and to the ADAM files that are in the simulator. The FISCHEM parameters were, were come from a, an analysis of all the literature data that is available. And the hydroxy metabolite uh, very much assumes the same as the parent in absence of data at the time this was uh, developed. The absorption for itraconazole was updated. It used to be uh, through MDCK data, but it was updated in version 19 for the to be predicted using the MECPEF model in the simulator to calculate the effective uh, permeability. And the FU gut we use in the SimSIP file is assumed to be equal to the fraction unbound in the plasma. The Q gut was then optimized to, to be able to capture the observed FG from some, clinical some of the clinical studies. In terms of the distribution, the VSS was predicted using uh, method one in the simulator, and uh, we're using a minimal PPK model. And a KP scalar was used on to, to uh, optimize the VSS value to be able to capture the Cmax in the clinical studies. In terms of elimination data, we, the SimSIP model uses data from uh, recombinant enzymes, and they've been scaled using uh, fractional bound to the microsomes, and also the ICEF value uh, that matches the recombinant system used in the publication by Isa Heronen from 2004. In the SimSIP file, we also include um, clearance for, for SIP1A1, although this has been added as uh, in the position of uh, a SIP1A2 as a surrogate, as, as currently we don't have the option to include a SIP1A1 in the simulator. In terms of interaction parameters, we've obviously got SIP3A4 included, um, but uh, we've also added additional interaction parameters in the uh, file over the last couple of years, including uh, KI values for, for UGT1A1 and also the transporters, BCRP, OATP1B3, and OATP2B1. And the hydroxy itraconazole file was uh, developed using a, a similar approach for, for the other parameters, although some were assumed, as I mentioned earlier, to be the same as the parents in, in absence of any other data. 
So the other two PBK models that I'm going to talk about today have been published over the last couple of years. The first was a publication from AstraZeneca in, in 2008, which looked at itraconazole and also two of its metabolites, both hydroxy and the keto itraconazole metabolite. And the second publication came out towards the uh, end of uh, 2019 from the IQ Consortium. And it was a working group of um, a working group from a number of uh, different pharmaceutical companies who looked at developing new data or uh, generating new data for itraconazole and, uh, and its metabolites and, and developing on the back of this a, a PPK model in, in SIMSIP. So I'm just going to talk on the next few slides on, on some comparisons over the differences in, in some of the models. And then I'll, I'll move on to, to look at how they perform in terms of PK and, and DDI predictions. So the AZIP publication um, developed their PVK model for, for itraconazole using version 15 of the simulator. The FizChem and absorption parameters used in that file were the same as uh, are there in the SimSIP first order file. The distribution um, uses was <coughs> you, uh, predicted using method one. However, there, instead of using a minimal PVK model, a, a full PVK model was, was used. There was some new data generated to, to help develop this file. AstraZeneca um, measured uh, the elimination parameters using recombinant enzymes, and also measured the interaction parameters. They, they measured the KI values for, for CYP3A4, for both itraconazole and also the hydroxy and, and keto metabolites. In terms of the values, um, I'll talk a little bit about the interaction parameters in, in a couple of slides time. The clearance was, was fairly comparable to that used in the um, SimSIP file, although it was slightly uh, higher um, than the values we had in, in the simulator. As I mentioned, it also, they also generated a lot of data for, for keto itraconazole as a, a secondary metabolite, and that can be used currently in the uh, substrate position in the, in the simulator, so it uh, can also be used to, to generate PK profiles, and you can look at the DDIs. Um, by, by just altering the way that we're looking at uh, uh, measuring the DDIs in, in SIMSIP, simulating them. The other publication was from the IQ Consortium, as I mentioned on the previous slide, and they published two new models for itraconazole. They also looked at uh, an ADAM file, but based on the uh, limited ver number of uh, substrates in, in version 16, they decided to, uh, that also used a, a matched ADAM model. Most of the <coughs> paper focused on looking at first order files, uh, looking at a fasted solution file and a, a fed capsule file. In terms of, of how that model looks, there, there's um, a lot of uh, extra data was generated by the working group, the IQ working group, and there was uh, a number of the FizChem parameters were based on, on newly measured data from uh, meta-analysis or analysis of all the data that was generated by that working group. There was a lot of in vitro data generated by all the companies involved, and uh, the in vitro elimination was input into that model as a geomean value generated from all of the data. Um, unlike the previous two models that used recombinant data to input the CYP3A4 uh, clearance parameters of Emax and KM, the IQ model used uh, data from human liver microsomes with also measured FU MIC values and, uh, from each of the laboratories that measured the intrinsic clearance values from those liver microsomes. And all of the metabolism from the liver microsomes was assigned to, to CYP3A4 in the simulator. As with the other models, the uh, volume of distribution was predicted using method two. The IQ also used a, a minimal PBK model, but they also used the uh, single adjusting compartment to fit the uh, clinical exposure profiles. The fraction unbound in plasma was also uh, updated based on newly generated data from the, the working group. And uh, it was around tenfold lower than the uh, previously used values in, in that we have in, in SimSIP and, and the AstraZeneca file. In the IQ file, the FU gut value was, was set to one rather than being uh, matched to the fraction unbound in the plasma. And the absorption <coughs> was further captured using CACO2 data, which was also generated by the working group. And an absorption scaler was used to scale the CACO2 data based on uh, some reference compounds that we used in the uh, CACO2 experiments. It was noted that the, um, they noted in the file, that they, in, in the publication, that there was an under prediction of the uh, in vivo clearance from the in vitro metabolism data. And some additional work was, was done to look at um, 
why this might be. And based on some hepatic uptake data in, in uh, hepatocytes using an OATP inhibitor rifamycin at 2 millimolar, it was uh, suggested that itraconazole may be a substrate for hepatic transporters. And due to this, uh, the hepatic uptake scalar was in, included in the um, elimination part uh, tab in the, uh, in the PVK model they developed in, in SimSIP. When looking at how the models performs, I'm just going to look at some of the some parameters uh, from some of the models. Um, one of those parameters is, is the FG, and the simulated FG was, was looked at in, in each of the models um, from the publications and uh, the SimSIP file, and compared against the clinical data with uh, grapefruit juice. This was two publications from Govins et al. Uh, the first black dot comes from the uh, 2004 publication, which was mean data. And the second two uh, black observed data points come from the, the second publication, which were for male and, and female subjects split out. And you can see that the, the observed FG appears to be around sort of uh, 0.8 for, um, the, from the clinical studies with grapefruit juice. And you can see just here the, the FG, simulated FG from the SimSIP first order files uh, in blue, the AZ in orange, and the IQ files in, in gray. The, looking at some of the other parameters, the uh, VSS um, was also compared against some of the clinical data that was available. The clinical data here was taken from some IV studies that were published in 2004, and this was four different doses of, of itraconazole administered by the IV uh, uh, infusion over a short infusion. And again, the SIMSIP files in blue, the AstraZeneca in, in orange, and the IQ file in grey. And, and all of those, all three publications fit around the range of, of observed VSS values, although they differ from sort of low up to the, to the high range between the uh, SIMSIP and IQ file. But all methods use, uh, all, all of the uh, PVK models use method one to predict VSS. And uh, the only difference there being that the, the SIMSIP and uh, AstraZeneca models use the KP scalar to look to optimize the uh, VSS. In terms of the interaction parameters, there was uh, quite a difference in terms of the values used between the models, although this is probably expected given the large variability that's seen in the uh, reported SIP3-4 values, in uh, KI values in the, the literature. Looking at just the general search on uh, Washington database, the IDB, there's a, a, around 46 different studies using a whole range of different um, substrates for SIP3 or 4. And the mean KI value was, in fact, around 0.96. You can, you can see the range of reported KI values range from down the value that's been used in the, uh, the SIMSIP compound file of 0.0013 all the way up to 11 micromolar, which is a, a huge range in, in potency of the interaction with uh, SIP3 or 4. Interesting, if you just split that out and look at midazolam alone, rather than at all the different substrates, the, the mean KI value is very comparable to that but overall. So there's still some value, even if you uh, vary variability in those interaction parameters, even if you, you scale that down. One thing I should say is, is we should treat that data with some caution, as it was a mixture of bound and, and unbound data. The, for a lot of the publications, there wasn't any enough data to be able to calculate FUMIC values and, and scale absolute uh, KI values. But it gives an idea that there's quite a big variability in the, the published values. But all of the published, all of the models the, for itraconazole use KI values at the, the lower end of those reported range. The AstraZeneca itraconazole KI was uh, around three and a half fold lower than the values used in, in SimSIP. And the IQ value that was calculated from IC50 data, which was generated by the working group, was uh, quite comparable to the, the value we used in, in SIMSIP for itraconazole. So just moving on to looking at how those models perform, um, I'm going to first start by looking at how the um, three models perform, looking at a whole range of uh, a range of P clinical PK studies. And then I'll move on to looking at how they perform over a, a range of uh, DDI studies. And all of these simulations were conducted in, in version 19 as a simulator. There were 18 clinical PK studies which I've used for this analysis. And these were a mixture of uh, IV studies to look at the performance of the models under IV dosing. 
and then looking at single and multiple dosing for both the uh, solution and capsule um, compound files. Along with looking at the performance uh, against observed data, I've also got some uh, going to show some precision data, so the absolute average fold error um, for the clinical studies that were evaluated. As I say, these have really been selected to, to try and match the compound files that are available for, for the different Ichikons or published models. So I'm first going to start by showing you some of the um, single dose IV data. So first here is the uh, SIMSIT file. And this is just a, an example of, of one of the IV simulations. This will be the same over the next few slides, where it's just showing one set of observed data to give an idea of how the models are performing, uh, along with the absolute average fraud error at the, the bottom. And you can see here that we're, we're capturing reasonably well the general elimination profile for itraconazole and, and hydroxyitraconazole with uh, average fraud error of around point two fold for, for both AUC and uh, clearance in this case against observed values. Itraconazole, uh, sorry, the AstraZeneca model for itraconazole uses the, the full PPK model. And you can see that this captures the uh, el elimination of, of itraconazole quite nicely in terms of the parents, uh, although the clearance is, is maybe a little bit uh, higher especially at the terminal phase of, of the profiles, although again, we're, we're capturing the AUC and clearance quite nicely for, the, uh, for both itraconazole and, and hydroxyitraconazole. The IQ file uses the um, uh, minimal model with the uh, single adjusting compartment also. And here we're not fitting the, the profiles quite as well as maybe we see for the AstraZeneca, but again, we're fitting, we, we've got the general fit against the uh, elimination of, of uh, itraconazole. And we've got a slight over prediction there for the, um, the uh, formation of the hydroxy after an IV dose. Moving on to look at some of the, the single dose. So first, I'm going to look at the uh, compound files using the single dose, uh, single, sorry, the, the fasted solution files from both SIMSIP, uh, AstraZeneca, and the IQ file. And the first of these show how um, we perform with the um, single dose solution fastest uh, study. And just a, a note here that obviously the, the SIMSIP file was originally developed to, to capture multiple dose studies. So we weren't really expecting it to pick up the single dose quite as well as, as maybe some of the other studies. And this is shown here where we don't really, we don't have as good a, a don't pick up the AUC quite as well for we're using the uh, for itraconazole using the, the SIMSIP file. We see an improvement here potentially for, for looking at uh, AUC, although with the, the AstraZeneca file we're seeing uh, precision around the, the, the CMAX is not so good for, for, um, for the single dose study. The IQ file again quite um, performs over across the board slightly better in terms of picking up the, the single dose uh, fasted solution file, picking up the profiles here, and, and also for the hydroxy uh, itraconazole as well, it performs quite nicely. I should say here that the, the, the gray lines, the, the, the black line you're seeing on all of these graphs is, uh, is the mean from the simulated trials, and all the simulated trials have been uh, set up to, to match the, the clinical studies that we're, we're simulating. The gray lines show all of the individuals from those simulations. And I think what's probably apparent here is we're seeing quite a lot of variability in the, in the simulations. And that's somewhat expected because we, we see quite a lot of variability in the clinical data for, for itraconazole. Moving on to look at the um, fasted solution file under multiple dose. And, and again, in, in this sort of scenario, actually all the files perform reasonably well. Um, the uh, SIM, SIP and AstraZeneca files were, before, were developed to, to be able to pick up multiple dose exposures. And we can see here that we're picking up both um, itraconazole and, and hydroxy itraconazole reasonably well. And that's shown in some of the uh, AFE calculations, the precision at the, the bottom. The IQ file also performs well under multiple dose. And again, that's shown uh, nicely with the AFE calculations at the bottom. Moving on to look at the uh, capsule dose. And this was a capsule dose designed to, to pick up FED studies. And uh, again, the SIMSIP file um, is not designed really to pick up the, the single dose, but performs reasonably well when you, you look at the single dose studies. 
particularly when you look at the, the precision calculations for that. The AZ file performs similarly well, although you can see here that the, uh, the CMAX is not captured so well for the, the AstraZeneca file. And that's partly because we're, we're looking, we're using a, the AstraZeneca file is using a, a full PPK distribution, and that's pulling the, the TMAX a little bit earlier than we see using the minimal and the minimal and uh, single adjusting compartment models of, of SimSip and IQ. Sorry. So that's one point just to make about the, the AstraZeneca file when we're looking at a single dose, a trichomazole dose. The IQ file performs, again, as, as with the, the solution file, performs reasonably well across the board for, for the um, single-dose uh, fed study, capsule studies and picks up the um, itcher and hydroxy itcher quite nicely across the, against the, the published studies. As with the solution dose, um, all three models perform fairly well in under uh, multiple dose capsule studies and they all perform fairly similarly in terms of the precision of the, the studies that they that we evaluated for the uh, multiple dose fed capsule studies. I think one point to point out here again is you can see there's quite a lot of variability in terms of the individual data and that's shown across all of the models that there's, there's a reasonable amount of variability in terms of the simulated values. And just to pick up on the uh, variability, um, so we looked at the variability across uh, itchcomazole both of the AUC and CMAX values. And it was generally high across all the clinical studies, and it's thought this is due to the complex both absorption and metabolism of, of itraconazole. And I've just shown here some simulations from three different um, multiple dose clinical studies, and they've been dosed at 100 mg of uh, itraconazole dose for 15 days. There's only one observed data point here, as that was the only clinical study that, that had all of its data published in a, a tabular form. But it gives an idea and, uh, of, of where we expect the observed data to be after multiple dosing of itraconazole. And you can see that the AUC and CMAX values are predicted reasonably well for all the models uh, across the different simulations. The IQ model has a, a slightly higher um, predicted AUC and, and CMAX values compared to the, the uh, SimSip in blue and the AstraZeneca file in, in orange. Although maybe has slightly higher variability. I should mention that these values are shown as, as mean and, and also standard error of mean uh, values. So I think it's noted in all the models that have been published and also in the SimSip file that we, uh, we do see high variability, but that really goes hand in hand with the fact that we see high variability in the clinic as well with a lot of the published data. I also wanted to make a mention of the uh, ketoetraconazole metabolite. There's uh, a lot of data now being generated to, to look at the ketoetraconazole metabolite. Although it does appear to have minimal impact in terms of with the values we currently have for it in terms of uh, PK prediction, in terms of the multiple dose exposure of uh, itraconazole and, and hydroxy itraconazole. In the simulations here, I've just shown um, the blue line here is... is um, the simulation of with including the keto itraconazole metabolite and the, and the oranges with no keto itraconazole um, included in the simulation. And you can see here that there's minimal difference of, uh, in terms of the PK exposure under this dosing scenario, which is once daily, um, of whether we have keto or, or included or not. And I think this goes, uh, <coughs> matches some of the observations made in the publication by the IQ consortium. We also looked at some of the DDIs that we're going to present in a, in a few slides time to look at the, the prediction of the AEC ratios in the presence and absence of uh, keto itraconazole. And there was around about less than a 10% difference in the AUC ratios that were predicted or simulated um, with, with keto included or not. And because of this, um, for the following DDI simulations that I'll show, we include keto itraconazole in the uh, comparison. It's just a summary on the PK um, exposure we've seen. The um, SimSip and, and AZ files were really developed to capture multiple dose simulations to match some of the commonly dosed uh, regimens that are used for itraconazole in, in DDI studies. The models performed fairly comparably across all the different dosing regimens, and particularly when evaluating multiple dose clinical studies, and that was apparent uh, in some of the last slides of the, the capsule studies where the precision was fairly comparable across all the models that we evaluated. 
looking at the single dose studies, the IQ model across the board probably performs better looking at uh, single dose citraconazole exposure, and I'll, I'll talk more on that as we, we go look at some of the DDI simulations. As I mentioned in the last slide, because the keto intraconazole metabolite didn't have much impact on the, the PK or DDI, for the, for the simulations that you're going to see the following slides, it was excluded from the, the DDI comparisons with the AZ file was used. So looking at the uh, PPK model comparison in terms of the DDI studies, there were 24 published DDIs that we, we looked at in this uh, work. And as I said, all of the simulations for this were done in, in version 19 of the, the simulator. And for all clinical studies, we use matched designs, both in terms of trial designs and populations that were used for the, uh, for the DDI studies. We looked at, overall, we looked at 10 oral midazolam studies, and that actually included four solution uh, doses of, of itraconazole, and, and six involved uh, capsule administration of, of itraconazole. All the rest of the clinical studies we looked at used uh, capsules for, for itraconazole. There were two IV studies using, um, sorry, that should be solution for that, uh, but two IV studies using midazolam. There, then we looked at uh, a number of studies using triazolam. Well, there were some other studies using alprazolam, zolpidem, simvastatin, rapaglinide, quinidine, and, and peroxetine, all of these being uh, substrates that are available in the simulator. The prediction accuracy of the DDIs was looked at by comparing the observed AEC ratios against the predicted AEC ratios, which is shown in the predicted shown on the y-axis, the observed on the x-axis. The uh, line of uh, unity is shown as the solid line in the middle, with the uh, two-fold error shown as the, the dotted lines, uh, the extremes. And then we're showing the prediction accuracy in terms of the guess criteria. And Generally, for the, the SIMSIP file, we've got a, a general over prediction. We'll see this in some of the uh, bias and precision calculations on the, the next slide. The closed squares uh, represent studies where itraconazole was dosed uh, multiple dose, and the open circles represent studies where, where itraconazole was dosed as a, a single dose. And you can see here that with the, the SIMSIP file, as perhaps expected from some of the, the PK exposure, we see a general um, uh, overprediction of the, the DDIs when we've got a, a single dose uh, of itraconazole in that DDI study. The AstraZeneca model, shown in the middle in green here, um, again, we have a, a slight overprediction for a, a number of the, the single dose studies. But generally, we, we get fairly good predictions for, for most of the compounds. We've got a, a couple at uh, the top of the higher AUC, observed AUC ratios, where we see a, an overprediction above the twofold, just above the twofold criteria. The IQ follow, uh, model performs a little bit differently. It's, it has a general uh, underprediction in terms of, of the bias, but all of the parameters, all of the uh, points fall within the um, guest criteria and, and the twofold of uh, unity for both single and, and multiple dose studies. Just looking at in terms of um, some of the statistics, the predictions, uh, this slide here just gives a summary of the uh, bias and precision of the predictions. As I alluded to on the previous slide, if we look first to look at the, the single dose studies, the SIMSIP file generally has a, a, an over prediction in terms of uh, bias uh, when you look at 1.88 and a precision of 1.99. And we saw that clearly with the single dose studies falling higher uh, with the over prediction. The AstraZeneca file, um, the precision is, is better at around 1.5, uh, 1.6. But the, uh, we still see an overprediction of the uh, single dose DDI studies with a, a bias of 1.25. The IQ file performs, uh, as I mentioned earlier, alluded to earlier, the, it performs quite well under single dose, and that follows through to the um, DDIs, where you get a, a good prediction of the single dose studies, both in terms of bias and precision. Moving on to the multiple dose studies, if we first focus on the, the precision, actually when you look at the precision of, of the DDI studies, they're all fairly comparable across the models. And this is, is probably to be expected given that the models are, were designed, uh, particularly the SIMSIP, for, for multiple dose exposures. There is a bit of a difference though in terms of, of the bias. As I mentioned before, the, the SIMSIP file has a general overprediction of the DDIs and, and the IQ file has a, a general underprediction of, of the DDIs. So 
just to sort of summarize that, the, the SIMTIP file does not form as well for, for single dosage clomazole DDI studies, and the IQ file might be a better option if you've got DDI studies where you're using single dose itraconazole. SIMSIT file, although has an overprediction, may offer a sort of worst case scenario for evaluating any potential drug interactions with itraconazole. And overall, the IQ file sort of has a, a general underprediction trend that picks up the generally picks up the uh, the DDIs quite well under single and multiple dose. Before I just move to some conclusion slides, I just wanted to to highlight uh, some case studies that are available in the literature and that also some of our consultancy team have worked on at, at SIMSIP. The first case study was using the uh, SIMSIP first order um, itraconazole file. And this was used uh, in conjunction with developing a PBK model for ivosidenum. Ivo and it was developed, this model for the, the substrate was developed from both uh, in vitro and clinical data for that compound. And it's been published uh, earlier this year by Prakash et al. And the publication is shown at the top here. What they looked at was the interaction of uh, the substrate was evaluated after multiple daily doses of, of itraconazole. And itraconazole was dosed under a fairly common dosing regimen of 200 mg uh, once daily for 18 days. And you can see here that the, the prediction of the interaction with the substrate, which was a, a 6 3 4 substrate, was picked up reasonably well. When we look, we use the, the SIMSIP first order compound file. In this clinical study, they also measured the uh, concentrations of both itraconazole and uh, hydroxy intraconazole. And just shown here on this slide, it's not published data, but it's uh, kind of given permission to show this today, of uh, the, both the itraconazole and, and hydroxy itraconazole into subject data. And you can see here that the, the SIMSIP file picks this data up quite nicely with the um, uh, across the whole dosing from, from day one out through to day 18. And this can be looked at in terms of um, the observed and predicted uh, CMAX and C-TROF data, and we're picking up both uh, CMAX and C-TROF with the, uh, the first order itraconazole file, quite nice for both uh, itraconazole and hydroxy itraconazole. It's also been used, uh, it, after the SIMSIT first order file has also been used to look at verification of uh, SIP304 for a number of different compounds. This case study here was just showing for a, a, a treatment A and it shows here with the, to look at verification of, of the CYP3A4 assigned to, to treatment A and evaluated against the clinical study. The simulation was conducted with, uh, to match the clinical study design that was conducted with, with treatment A and itraconazole using 10 virtual subjects and, and, and uh, 10 virtual trials, sorry, and 16 subjects in the same demographics. And the simulated DDIs with treatment A were all within uh, around well, 1.03 to 1.04 of the observed values. And the graphs here really just highlight some of the uh, CMAX and AUC ratios that we simulated using the, the first order itraconazole file and treatment A. At the bottom, you can see the uh, CMAX and AUC values that uh, were actually, again, we had uh, itraconazole data from this clinical trial. And you can see how we're picking up both the uh, CMAX and AUC naught to infinity data for itraconazole. And it's simulated very well compared to the observed data that was provided. Just in summary, before I go to the final conclusions, I, I just thought I'd come back to this. I just wanted to touch on the, the SIMSIP uh, itraconazole ADAM model. It was introduced in version 19. You can activate this by, by switching on ADAM in the absorption tab. And it was developed to pick up the complex formulation effects of, of itraconazole. Um, just showing here are the same DDI studies that uh, we had a, a few slides back for the first order files. And you can see that the, the ADAM model performs pretty well across all the different dosing scenarios, both the single dose and multiple dose. Like the IQ file, there's a the general uh, underprediction bias for using the, um, the ADAM file although the precision is very comparable to what we see from, from all the other models that have been used. So just in conclusion, really, we've, we've cut a lot of different scenarios here, but the, the three first-order itraconazole compound files were compared from, from both SIMSIP, AstraZeneca, and, and the IQ studies. And they were selected to, to look at specific PK studies to match how those compound files have been, been developed and looked across 24 different DDI studies. 
In terms of the multiple dose PK exposure, all the models performed comparably when we looked at both the PK uh, exposure of itraconazole and its metabolite hydroxy itraconazole. Although the IQ file was able to better pick up the uh, single dose itraconazole exposure, um, and that really followed through to when you, you looked at predicting the DDIs uh, after itraconazole had been given single dose. In terms of the DDIs, the, the SIMSIT first order file had a general over prediction of the, the DDIs. So perhaps offers a worst case scenario for evaluating drug interactions. And the IQ file has a, a general under prediction of, of the DDIs with, with AstraZeneca sitting in between. In terms of further work we're considering on itraconazole, there's a, obviously a whole raft of new data that's been generated on, on itraconazole over the last couple of years. And we're going to take a look at all that in vitro data to see if there's any further refinements that can be made on the, the PBK models that we can use within SimSIP. That's also going to include looking at incorporating inhibition of PGP. But currently, none of the models incorporate this in, in the files that we currently have available. We're also going to be looking at the SimSIP Adam file a little bit more over the, the next year or two and looking at further refinements on additional data that's being generated to, to better model the um, absorption properties of, of itraconazole after both the capsule and, and solution dose. And that comes to the end of talk. I'm happy to take any questions now. I'll, leave, I'll maybe hand back to, the, to you to run this part of it. Thanks, Pete. That's really great. Um, yeah, just a reminder that you can mute you to ask a question. Um, otherwise, there's the chat box or the Q&A, whatever people prefer uh, using. Okay. Uh, um, you've got a question from Kunal. Okay, Kunal, uh, do you want to uh, go ahead? Hi, Ali. Can you hear me? Yeah, clearly. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Ali. Uh, thank you, Pete, for the uh, comprehensive uh, uh, presentation. I, I mean, my query was you sort of had in your future work. I mean, I was interested in knowing, uh, you know, why PGP has not been included so far, especially, you know, with the traconazole, we, we try to tease out the PGP versus CYP3A4 from a clinical DDI. Uh, I mean, also was wondering, you know, some of the overestimations found, was that due to not including PGP? Uh, so just wanted to hear the thoughts or the discussion on not having PGP so far. Yeah, I think, I mean, it, it's a good question. I, you know, I think in terms of actually our, what we do a lot with our consultancy group is, is we, we do have a PGP value that hasn't fully gone into the simulated file that you'll see in there, there but we, we do have values that we are being used and certainly a lot of the regulatory submissions will probably have included a, a PGP inhibition value when it's, it has been used. So it's you're right, it's, it's time that that needs to be fully incorporated and, and may well help capture some of those DDIs um, that we're considering for some of those substrates, yes. Okay, thanks. Um, you have another question from Maria. I'll just unmute Maria as well. Hi, Maria. Are you uh, able to speak? I don't think we can hear Maria at the moment. Okay, no problem. We'll come back to Maria. You've got another question from Tammy in the chat box. Uh, I can't see that one. Um, it says, how will PGB inhibition be incorporated into the model using clinical DDI data or in vitro data? Yeah. Um Good question. <laughs> it's going to be a mixture of both. I think we're going to be looking at the in vitro data that's available. Um, there's been some work already done to, to look at uh, scaling of that in vitro PGP data to be able to capture the, the clinical DDI data. So I think it's going to be a mixture of the work that's been done and published, um, I think, in some posters previously for, uh, for other uh, incorporation of PGP and other compounds. So it will be a mixture of using that data and, and knowledge that we've had for, for scaling the PGP data to incorporate it for itraconazole. 
You've got another question from Yu Ching. I've just folded it to the panelists. Um, can you see that one, Pete? It says, uh, can you compare the PK profiles between slide 24 and 36 and tell us what were the difference in terms of model and dosing scenarios? Uh, slide. I guess it's the Adam. Uh, I think it means 35 and 24. 24? As in this one, are we thinking? As in the DDI comparisons, are we talking? Oh, the PK in slide 24 is not uh, Maybe if uh, Yu Ching could uh, be unmuted, it might help, because uh, I'm not sure that the slides correspond to... Um... Yeah, so this is the one, 24. I, I don't know if you can hear me. <laughs> yes, yeah, can so hear you now. Yes, oh, okay, great. So this one, um, so the um, intracarnazole um, dosing scenario is um, fasting or fat condition. This PK is called your dosing, this dosing, the data set. Because uh, if you see this PK data set, you can see clearly the model or the data has not uh, reached a steady state after uh, maybe uh, 14 days. And but the figure you show in your case study, um, slide 32, I guess, um, 32 or 36, which uh, in that case, the, the PK already reached steady state using the first order um, itraconazole file. So I, I just want to know Yeah. it's because of the model setting different or yeah, the data set was different. Different, different models. So this model, slide 24, was using the, the pu publication from AstraZeneca to look at the inclusion and exclusion of the keto itraconazole file. Slide 30, this one. This was using the SIMSIP first order file to simulate the PK exposure. So it's two different compound files we're considering as well. Yes, so if that means if we apply this uh, dosing file to AstraZeneca, um, the one you're showing on slide 24, the fitting will be a little bit different? Possibly. I don't. I mean, this is. I, I don't have all this data. Sadly, it's a. It's an example we've been allowed to use from a, a client that we've worked with. Um, but yes, potentially, if we extracted this data, it would look slightly differently for this. I, I haven't looked at that. And uh, do we usually? Is, I think we usually expect the steady state already reached after 14 day repeat dosing for itraconazole under yeah. fasting condition. Right. Okay. Thank you. All right, guys, you've got a few more questions that I've posted in the chat to you. Yeah, I think. so I see Maria's. Thanks, Maria. We've got your questions now. Um, so you say for the new model verification, could you look into SIP 3 or 4 substrates with longer half-life than midazolam? Yes, potentially, if the clinical data is available. If you have any clinical data or anyone on the line that would like to share with us, of course, we'd love to hear from you as well. But yes, if the, data, the clinical data is available, we'd be happy to look at other substrates to include in that as well. And I think the last question was from um, Christian. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the PGP work, um, we've got there's some um, publications uh, in terms of posters on, on the website looking at uh, incorporating PGP. I can certainly make those available, Christian, if you'd like to, to look at those, and, and it will be based on some of the scaling strategies, looking at incorporating PGP from those is, is the current thinking for itraconazole, although that's a work in progress at the moment for, for version 21. And I think that's all the questions from what I can see. Okay. Um, okay. I think um, I think that's all the questions that we have. Um, thanks, Peter, um, for your talk. Of course, if there's any follow-up questions, I'm sure Peter will be happy to uh, take any emails. Um, I don't know why he's not put his email address on there, but you can find it soon enough. Um, the the last thing I just wanted to 
raised before uh, people go is our, our next talk in uh, 2021. Um, we're still talking about COVID in 2021, unfortunately. <laughs> but here is a, a, going to be a great talk by Venkatesh, and it's based on his recent uh, publication. Um, and essentially, it's looking at um, um, the complications in looking at in individuals um, taking into account the effect on, of cytokines, and we know their effect to um, affect expression levels of uh, enzymes and transporters, and, and essentially is trying to look at using PBBK um, to um, use this to inform models um, for looking at diverse um, patient um, data sets. So we're looking forward to that, that talk in, um, in January. Uh, it'll be at the same time as, uh, as usual four o'clock in the UK. Um, okay, thanks very much for joining us today. And um, as I mentioned, this should be available on YouTube shortly. Thank you.